You're listening to the Real Estate Runway Podcast, powered by Quattro Capital, where we are all about alternative business and investment strategies to help you amplify life and maximize wealth. Here's your host, the recovering engineer turned multifamily investor, Chad Sutton. All right, Real Estate Runway family, welcome to another episode of the Real Estate Runway podcast. I'm your host, Chad Sutton, and I'm joined with a longtime friend and fellow real estate entrepreneur, badass of mine, Tyler Mikulajcik. Tyler started off flipping houses in his early real estate career, transitioned to multifamily, and became a self-made millionaire before he was 30 years old, guys. He's owned, at the time of this writing, six and a half million net worth of real estate and counting. This is a brain. This is a guy who loves giving back. Tyler, welcome to the show. How are you doing, brother? Hey, Chad, man. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you. Yeah, it's good to have you. When did we first meet, man? It's been a couple of years now, and it was one of our many conferences we've been to together, I think, right? Yeah, I think it was Ultimate Partnership in Boston. Yeah, that, back, before all this, back before all this pandemic business, wasn't it? <laughs> oh, yeah. No mask, none of that, you know, yeah, it, was yeah. a, it was a immediate connection. And actually, I think I met your uh, whole team before it became a team. That's right. You met Quattro Capital before we were Quattro Capital. That's fantastic. I love yeah. it, man. Well, if you just like give us an insight into who you are and how you, I mean, that little brief bio I just gave, amazing. Like just walk us through mm -hmm. then to now, man. Show us, show us some gold here. Yeah, so I mean, you know, yeah, you know, I started in 2012, um, you know, so it's been, it's been a long run and that's kind of like right after the crash and there was a lot of opportunity for single family homes. So, and I was so new to the stage. So I really was studying everything I can. I didn't really have that kind of mentorship that I, that I have nowadays, um, you know, and access to that. Cause I was, um, you know, penny pinching back then. You didn't want to spend money on mentorship and stuff like that. So Anything that was free available to me, I, I sucked it up and bought the first house. You know, uh, it, I lived in it actually. I house hacked it. I lived in it for two years, and then I sold it. And I think I made like around eighty k on that. Um, you know, somewhere around there. And and then I just you know I kept buying more and I scaled it. And then you know three years ago um, is when I was like finally you know just wanted to pit it, and um, I bought twenty one units my first year and multifamily, um, like just kept buying, buying, buying. And, you know, uh, since then, um, I've probably bought and sold 51 units and uh, currently it's 34 units right now. And there's, you know, that's, that's not syndicating either, you know? So that's a, there's a big difference in that. You know, I so, love, yeah, I mean, that, yeah, sorry to interrupt you there. I, I love when people say, man, I've got, I've got a thousand units. I've got 1500 units. It's like, yeah, but you own, you own 2% of it, right? You're talking about the stuff exactly. you, you took down yourself. You did it, you did it, you know, bootstrapping it and built up up to six and a half million in assets without partners for the most part, right? I'm sure you use some capital along yeah. the way, but mostly yeah. on your own. Yeah. I mean, that's, I feel like that's my next stage. Like I've talked to you about it privately about it. Like that's something I'm looking to go into, um, you know, to expand and do scale wise, but that's not how I started in, you know, I kind of, in my opinion, I did it the hard way. Um, you know, especially the single family game, like, you know, the amount of time that I spent on flipping houses and stuff like that, like the amount of like profit that I generated, I, I did that all in one year just by buying multifamily. Yeah. So it's kind of, it's, it's kind of funny how that works, but you know, and, and, and to top it off is, you know, I, I wanted to do multifamily when I was like 16 years old. So I just, you know, I was too scared. You know, I was reading the book by Dave Lindell back then and stuff like that. And it was just, it was just fear that held me back all those years. And I was just finally like, I had enough. I just, I was tired of a job. I was tired of like, when I say job, I mean flips, you know, like tired of trying to do that and working for money like that. So I was just like, enough's enough. I'm just going to take the risk. And I, and I jumped and I did it. And the uh, best thing I've ever done, not easy by any chance, not, not easy at all um learned a lot very quickly because <laughs> i you know on top of it i i bought stuff like in my opinion it was the ghetto like i bought class d stuff too yeah so it was it was tough and now i own like class b and a so it's a totally different bracket 
man, so many things we can unpack from there. And, and, you know, I love that you just, you basically just said all real estate investing is not created equal, right? I mean, you, you were a house flipper for a long time and generated a ton of cash, but you know, you only had as many as you flipped and you're only as good as your last flip. So you, you moved into overcoming the, the negative mindset of, of I, I, I'm afraid to do this. And you moved into this, this physical asset side where you're acquiring, you know, getting the depreciation, getting the cash flow, getting the upside of after value add, like you really changed your, your pivot there. So dude, mindset is everything in, in this, you know, in this world, what had to change and how did you get your mind right to make that jump from what you knew to what you didn't know? So, I mean, believe it or not, I mean, I've come from a family of business, you know, my, my father, my mother has, has a business. So they kind of like trained me when I was young to take over the company. Never actually happened, but you know, it, it had me thinking in the right direction um, and to work very, very hard, but that's what they taught me to work hard. So I knew that wasn't working smart. So what happened is I made a pivot. Actually, you know, I worked for the family company and I, and I'm leaving and um, what helped me leave and make that pivot was picking up a book by Grant Cardone, The 10X Rule. So, you know, I give him a lot of credit, you know, because back then my mentorship was books, you know, so I just needed some inspiration. Um, I already had it, like, you know, the motivation, everything. I just need somebody to say, hey, you know, this, you're doing the right thing, you know, keep going because I didn't have that, that company around me to say, you know, you're doing the right thing. So I did that, you know, and then I, and then I started consuming his content and, uh, you know, getting on his webinars, going back then, he had Periscope, you know, Meerkat, and you do live calls, um, you know, to me, that meant the world. It was like almost like a former mentorship. So, um, yeah, it just, it just pushed me. I knew, you know, one day I'm going to have that, that, that group of people around me and, you know, and I do now, um, but it just, I just kept believing I'll be there. And that's what kind of pushed me along. Um, and obviously, you know, when you make profit on a property, that helps you too. <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's absolutely right. So, so in part, it was getting the right company around you, being in the right positive company, the right, you know, people who agree with you that this is a real path you can take. Right. And then seeking yeah. knowledge and mentorship from, even if it's just books, right. I mean, I remember a time where, you know, neither one of us had anything and that's what you had to do. You listen to podcasts, you listen to books. I mean, there's look, look behind me on this camera, you guys on audio can't see this, but there's a huge bookshelf behind me of all these books that are, that are here. And I'll and I tell you, most of us probably have this level or more of books in our house and I've never read them, right? The information's out there, whether you want to, whether you want to pay for a structured program or go read books of, of 10 different people who have done this before, you can figure this out. You know, if, if Tyler and I can, you can as well. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> even if you don't, even if you don't have a physical book, I mean, sometimes that's hard for people too, right? So like, I think we're, I think it's, it's a really good thing that we have Audible now, you know, uh, things like MentorBox, you know, nobody yeah. knows about that. It's a way to summarize book, um, you know, stuff like that. So yeah. like, that's very uh, helpful. And those tools are available to people nowadays. It wasn't really available to me back then. And um, I think it would have helped me more because I can do things on the go. You know? That's absolutely right. And so you talk about getting around the right people here. And, and so you, you have this saying that, that a lot of people say, you may have learned it from Grant Cardone, I'm not sure, but your network is your net worth, right? How, how has that impacted you in your journey to become a self-made millionaire before 30? Oh, it's huge. I think that's everything. You know, if, if I went and lost my business today, and went to zero, as long as I could keep my contacts, I know I can bring it back up again. You know, like it, it really is your net worth. It's who you know and who you surround yourself with. Uh, yeah. Because like, it, 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 and it kind of goes into mindset. I'm a big mindset believer. I don't know if you can see behind me. I always keep these up, you know, the inspirational quotes and stuff like that keep me in check. And, you know, when you're getting around these, these guys that are actually doing something, it's, it's their mindset that's just going to kind of, you know, you're going to take on that mindset as well by being around that person versus being around somebody else who is doing average things or whatever. And they might have a negative mindset, you know, and, you don't want to take that on because subconsciously you're going to start doing these things and, and thinking this way and you don't even know it. So, um, you know, being around the right people is, is a huge contribution to your success period. No doubt about it. These posters behind you, the, the, the folks on audio can't see them and I can barely see them read them to us real quick. Cause I see some pretty cool stuff back here. Success nutrition facts. What's on that thing. I got to turn around for that one. Uh, <laughs> 
So we got, you know, to, to, to get to success, you got to do hard work, late nights, persistence, sacrifice, discipline. You got to go through rejections, criticism, failure, and doubts, right? And then th my favorite one is, is this one over here. It's, um, it's a, a tiger. And it's looking at a little baby tiger, but looking at a grown tiger in, in the reflection of the water. And it says mindset is everything because that little baby tiger is already thinking that it's already grown up and, and you know, doing things. So there's a lot of things you could take from that one little piece of saying. You know, I love that so much, dude. I got to pause on that because th that right there, I, I resonate with that so much because when before Quattro Capital controlled over 100 million in assets, right? we acted like we were there. When I looked at myself in the mirror, when we looked at ourselves in the mirror, we were already that operator, right? We, we, we knew we yep. were capable of it. We knew we had the expertise and we were already there. So I love that because we were just a kitten at that point and we were looking at a mm -hmm. grown ass tiger in the water. I love that. You set your direction, you know, like that's, that's the start of things. You have to believe you're going to have that. Um, you know, like for me, I'm a big uh, scheduler. Like I got to have an agenda book. I do the, actually the physical agenda book planner. And a lot of people criticize me for that. It's funny, but um, it works for me because I know I can pick it up. I can feel it and I can go see it and make edits real quick. And, and it's more real for me. Um, yeah. And I always constantly write my goals, you know, like I'm going to be a multimillionaire by the age of whatever, you know, I, I set. I actually, it's funny because I set my goal. Actually, I'll show you right now. Hold on. I uh, found this two days ago, my first 10 X planner. Love it. Okay. And um, they, they allows you to put goals and stuff like that. And that was in 2016, I got that planner. And I, I went through the goals the other day and said, I'm gonna be a millionaire by age of 30. I beat that, I think I was like 28 or 29 or something. And I'm like, so I beat it. But I was already thinking that. And I, I set my intent on that. So I believe that, you know, whether it's manifestation or stuff like that, like you gotta set your intent first and then your actions will follow almost every single time you know, or a goal or whatever, you're going to go buy hundred million dollars in real estate. Like, you know, most likely you're going to end up going that direction because you're looking for it. That's you right. Know? There's so much truth in that, man. I love that. And I love that you can look back and be like, this was my intention and I surpassed it. Why? Because I wrote it down. It wasn't just a dream. And I also formed an action plan to get there. And you did the same thing, right? Took massive mm -hmm. action every single day. I didn't really know that's what I was doing back then until recently and I'm like you know I actually yeah. I'm always manifesting and creating my outcome you know I didn't I thought I was winging it back then yeah <laughs> well our for our listeners I've come on this show a lot of times and talked about you know mindset is almost like when someone looks at you and says use the force Luke right no one knows what the hell the force is but you can you can hear you know looking at these these posters on your wall and, and things like that you can you can kind of feel what mindset is and how important it really is in getting where you're going so I love that man but let's let's take a pivot real quick. And, and you have done so much. So not only do I want to talk about your success story and your mindset, I want to talk about some meat, right? You have mm -hmm. done everything from buying class D properties to flipping individual houses. Like what are some renovation costs and tactics that, that you've or renovation lessons learned and tactics rather, excuse me, I caught myself reading mm -hmm. what that you've taught yourself or you've learned over this course of going from zero to six and a half million in assets what, what lessons have you learned here yeah so i think you know when i was flipping houses and it kind of went into when i do multifamily too um a big part of the profit was based on the rehab period you know like getting the rehab down but not sacrificing quality so a lot of guys i see like number one i would go to learn about flipping on a higher level i would actually walk through other flippers houses when they're doing it and meeting the contractors and stuff like that that's how I got a lot of contractors. I was hustling. And, you know, I was seeing their quality of work. And some guys was, was, was very, very low quality. It looks like they're just trying to get by and make a quick buck. And for me, I want to be in this game for the long, the long run, you know? So I was like, all right, you know, I got to do things right, but not overdo it and do the top of the line material, you know? So one, one lesson that I learned is, you know, number one, negotiating with contractors, you know, like, like the contracts period, like you got to negotiate the contracts. Um, you know, a lot of guys will walk off the job. If you give them the hundred percent up front, you'll, you'll lose that money most likely, even if you have a contract. So what I actually was doing for the longest time, and trust me, it wasn't easy because I would get a lot of pushback, like, and these guys would, you know, sometimes threaten you and stuff like that. 
I give them the money when they finish the job. You got to work to earn it. And, um, and, you know, I wasn't like being cheap about it. I just was like, Hey, you know, when you finish a task, you get paid. There's no reason why you shouldn't finish it. Like, like, so sometimes depending on the contractor, I would do 50%, um, halfway through the job. So they can actually start getting working and then I'll give hundred percent when they're done. So there's no change orders. That's the other thing. I hate change orders. I would not allow it. Um, that's just a way for them to, to upsell you and basically like, you know, uh, ruin your bottom line. So, you know, stuff like that. Also where you supply the materials for me, I would buy materials and then have them do the labor. So that's a big one too. Cause they would go and they basically go buy materials, but for other jobs and you wouldn't even know it and they would overbuy or something like that. And like, you're not going to go look to define print half the time. So they would get you there. So I would actually build up relationships with, uh, you know, um, suppliers, really good relationships. And I'd get things for pennies on the dollar and um, where everybody else is paying crazy, crazy money for. So I'd drop material costs. Um, so I would always come underneath everybody's budget. Like everybody's like, oh, I have a hundred grand rehab budget. I'm coming at 70, you know, every single time. Or I'd hit my exact budget I had planned. Um, so that, that definitely a, a contribution to to the success of when I was flipping um, versus a lot of gurus and people out there they are like, you know, they got to make quick 10, 20K in profit on a flip. To me, I think that's insane. Um, I think you got to make a lot more than that to be incentivized to do it because of the issues that come along with it, uh, like a bad septic system, you know, or some crazy major repair that always almost always pops up um, your whole 25 K profit would just be wiped out right there. So, um, and that, that kind of just, it got pushed over into the multifamily. So it's a different structure when I have the multifamily because I can, you know, you can get, you know, maintenance guys and different guys that can do a lot of that labor for you in, in a bulk fashion. Um, and you can, and it's a, you know, the law of large numbers, like you can do scale, like you can get one guy to do all your buildings with plowing and stuff like that. So it's, it's just a whole different ball game. Um, but the same philosophy and mentality applies, you know, when that, what I learned from the, the flips and, um, yeah, so, I mean, that's the rehab, the rehab situation. I think that's just key. I think a lot of people overlook that and, um, they get hurt. They don't know what they're doing with that. And they lose a lot of profit for sure. Uh, and understanding what quality of material to, to get and what design to do. Don't over price the market with your, with your uh, rehab. You know, so there's so it, much like there. a medium. Yeah, there's so much there. And, and I think, you know, just to go backwards, you, you're right. Not only is it, and, and, and I'm speaking mostly in the multifamily space here, but I'm sure this, this goes with the single family flipping space as well. Not only is it not over renovating for the market where you can't sell or rent what you're doing, but it's also making sure the revenue you think you're going to get matches the renovation. I can't tell you how many times yeah. I've seen uh, projects being sold as go spend three thousand dollars per unit. You're going to get a three hundred uh, three hundred dollar rent bump. It, the guys that doesn't exist. It, it, it's yeah. very rare that you find that, you know, yeah. and, and typically renovations like doing three thousand dollars in renovation on, on a unit that's not touching much, you know? No, so. no, not at all. That's a facelift, you know, yeah. it's like putting makeup on it. Yeah, um, basically. But you're, you're pretty much, you know, if you, if you overdo it, you, you're essentially throwing your money in the trash can because you're not going to get it back. Oh, you're you right. Know? I mean, think about a speedometer, like a, not a speedometer, a gauge, right? You have a gauge and it's like, you want to, you want to kind of redline that gauge a little bit and put enough pressure to get your little needle over there but that gauge only goes so far. And if you, if you just keep cranking up the pressure, i.e. spending more money, that needle can only go so far. You know, you're just, you're just wasting pressure, you know? Absolutely. It makes sense. That makes sense. So, you know, talk, basically, if I summarize everything you just did there, you're talking about, it really comes down to execution, right? You can write business plans all day long, but it comes down to execution, getting quality labor, getting you know, building those relationships to have economies of scale with whatever it is you're buying, you know, material wise, and making sure that the plans you write are actually, you know, actually effective and, and achievable, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, I, and also timing too, you know, like, it goes back into execution, um, you know, because when you're, 
I, I feel like we're going to talk more about flips and, I, and then my multifamily, but like it, it's a big part of my life, you know what I mean? So, and it's just made me who I am today. So like timing was everything too. Like I would get rehabs done in 30, 45 days and have them on the market. Wow. You know, like, yeah, holding, like costs, man. Really, holding costs are a real thing, yeah. you know? Yeah. Like yeah. that's big. And um, I mean, with the multifamily, you can kind of like, you can push that along over a long period of time if you wanted to, because you're still cash flowing. So it's a totally different, you know, philosophy, but yeah, you know, but you gotta be, you gotta be, you gotta execute, right. If these guys contractors, or if you have a plan, a business plan, Hey, you know, in one year, I want this 10 unit, 20, 30, 40 unit to be rehabbed and completely turned over or whatever. Like you better hope you execute because you know, it's, you're going to lose in rents because you can't up your rents. So, I mean, you are losing money in a different way though. Yeah. That makes sense. And, and just for the listeners to break that down, what, what he's saying there is if you're a house flipper and I'm, I'm making I'm making a couple of assumptions in this. If you're a house flipper and you're borrowing capital, for example, maybe you have a hard money loan that's costing you 10 percent all in or something like that. The longer you hold that loan, you know, the longer you hold that that asset and the longer you have that money drawn out on the loan, the more you're paying in holding costs. Right. And and, the, and so executing longer to a shorter plan is going to cause it's going to eat into your profit. Right. Because all that rolls into your net profit in the end, whereas in a multifamily situation. In theory, you have something that is cash flowing, producing cash flow. So you're you're looking at a couple of different revenue streams. You don't just have the sale that is your revenue stream for the, the um, flip. Right. You have people paying the rent along the way and the units you're not renovating. So you could, in theory, stretch out a multifamily flip over three years, right? Depending on how aggressive you want to be, you're losing some opportunity costs because you may not be able to get rents to their entitlement position in time. But there's also the idea that you're, it's an optimization game between how much am I paying in vacancy for how many units I have down at one time so that I can get to a higher rent level, right? It's all, it all plays together in this optimization play. Oh yeah, it, that, absolutely. And it's just, you know, you, you're able to, um, you can manage it differently, you know, with multifamily. Yeah. It, you, can, you can, why I love multifamily and I'm glad I'm not, like I kind of took a pause on the flips, you know, I think last year when the pandemic actually happened and kind of got scary, not gonna lie. I had a half a million dollar house I was doing and in like a really good location. Even then it was like scary though, because that's when everybody was like, what's gonna happen, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So for me, that was like a like a check because I didn't want to have like a way too. I didn't want to be like stuck with the house because I can rent the thing out all day long. But I'm like, I don't want to have one massive unit, you know, and have to deal with that. Like that's just it's small money compared to dealing with 10, 20, 30 units in one building. And right. I can go rehab, make a value add and go capture equity and income at the same time. It was a, like it just to me, it logically makes sense instead of doing a single family flip unless you're making a lot of money per flip. Right. You know? Right. Yeah. Have you heard about the Multifamily Investor Nation Summit coming up on January 20th? If you've never been, it's a three day information packed event for multifamily investors with over 1,000 attendees and over 50 speakers. Not only will you hear from experts about finding deals, raising capital, underwriting strategies, selecting markets, and so much more. But this year, our partners here at Quattro Capital are excited to be participating with three speakers at the event. Our amazing Kim Winland will be speaking on the often neglected subject of asset management, how to make the machine hum. While our most interesting man in real estate, Maurice Philogene, will be speaking on how to leave your corporate job for a freedom lifestyle. I personally will even be speaking on the topic of how to perform due diligence on multifamily assets before you purchase them and the not so common things to watch out for. Go to MFINsummit.com to grab your ticket and use promo code Quattro to get $100 off of your full access pass. Whether you are new to multifamily investing or a seasoned investor, you do not want to miss this event. Join Team Quattro at the Multifamily Investor Nation Summit. Visit MFINsummit.com, promo code Quattro. That's MFINsummit.com, promo code Quattro. Well, Tyler, that makes a lot of sense here. So if I adjust a little bit in our course you're you're kind of known as the deal guy man you find deals with dirt on them you, you find the stuff that people are scared to take down and you make money off of it right 
Mm -hmm. to get there, I'm sure you also have a bit of negotiation that goes into this. What negotiation skills can you share with the audience that would help them in their ventures? So, yeah, like that, that is my number one skill set for sure is, is getting the deals, like getting the good deals, um, things that nobody's seeing. I'm in like stealth mode, you know, and they only find out when I close. <laughs> so, yeah, they actually have, I, I, I bought quite a few this year and everybody's like, whoa, you bought that, you know, like, how'd you do that? And they're like, there was no deals. Everybody's complaining. There's no deals out there. I'm like, I've, I've seen more deals this year than I've ever seen. Yes. Period. And, you know, yeah, I mean, they're not like 2008 kind of valuations or 2010, you know, or the low, low, but like they got meat on the bone. Yeah. So, and what I'm doing is, you know, I'm, I'm cold calling owners or I get a team, the cold call, or I get in people's faces and it kind of goes back into like sales, you know, like I, I like I, I hit the ground running and, and cause I know nobody else is doing that. I'll do everything that everybody else is not doing. Yeah. Period. And, um, and whether, you know, I can, I don't always wear a suit. Right. So I'm kind of the, I wear sweatpants kind of like, I'm that kind of guy sometimes. So like, but like, I'll just, I'll dress for my prospect. Like I'll see what their lifestyle is. I'll study what they're doing and everything. And I'll show up accordingly. So it's immediately, it, it's a warm introduction and a lot of psychology goes into it, but you know, negotiation wise, you know, getting in person is key. Um, you know, when you get in, when you get face to face with somebody, try to set up an in person meeting with the owners. If this is a, if we're talking multifamily, I don't care how big they are, they can have 100, 200, 300 unit complex. You can still do it. They're just people, people's business. You know, like, there's always a decision maker. You know, if you have multiple partners, we'll get in a room with all five, four, three partners. You know, and then um, don't wear sunglasses. Take your sunglasses off. Look them right in the eyes. Make sure you can see the whites in your eyes. Like. Like there's a lot that goes into it, but it just comes down to like basic stuff at the end of the day, you know, it's just people. Um, and if they like you, like I was just doing a negotiation two nights ago, it was, it was, it was kind of crazy uh, because I was hosting my own meeting um, somewhere else. And I actually had to have somebody else host it for me temporarily for the hour. So I could go negotiate the deal in person with somebody because it was an opportunity. I'm like, I, I'm not missing this opportunity. And this is ongoing currently, so I'm not going to give too much detail. But, um, you know, I, I got, I got in contact with the owners. I had a referral off market and they got me to meeting and I showed up and the first thing that I, that I know will work is you got to get them to like you, right? Whether you smile and, and, and body language and stuff like that, like it doesn't even make sense sometimes. It's just, as long as they, you know, with their body language, they like you, then it's game on. And then I'm like, all right. And then I literally started negotiation. I was like, well, first things first, we, you know, you know that you're probably going to sell this to me because you like me and I like you. Right. And she's like, yeah, yes, I do. I go, great. We have a great start right now. I go, let's not even talk numbers, you know, <laughs> and that's it. And that's, that's how like this begins. And like, when you're just talking price, like you're an amateur negotiator, like you shouldn't be talking price up for the front. Like that just comes along down the road because like people sell based on needs and wants, not necessarily price. You know, it's like, are they going to value? What's your value you're bringing? Like in this situation, I was offering uh, more than price. I was offering um, the fact that, you know, I have good management and how I run my buildings and, my, and I like quality. So like, and they're going to know that that whole building is going to be turned over correctly and have be run correctly versus, you know, um, a New Yorker coming in and, and uh, running it to the ground or something like that, you know, because that's how it is in our market. Uh, they just they let these things go and they very they're very prideful about what they've done so understanding your prospect now you have you have a way to to have leverage by doing that so yeah there's, there's a lot that goes into negotiation i think it's key like and also like a good starting point for that too to like learn more about that i think the book is chris foss i think it's a really good book yeah i think it's a really good book to pick up um, cause there's like, and read it over like four or five times. Like you're not going to pick everything up the first time. That's right. Like there's like, yeah, like, you know, it, here's, I love this one. This is so awesome. Uh, and it conflicts with the book. Um, I think yes, or getting to yes. Getting to yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it conflicts with that. And I actually like Chris Voss's better, 
So you, the, the negotiation starts when you, when you get them to say no. So, and I firmly believe that because all the craziest deals I've gotten, like we had a disagreement right off the bat. Like I, I, I gave them a price they didn't like. And they're like, no, no way. And I'm like, oh, just starting now. Because you want them to think they're in control. So like, but really you're in control. So you want them to think that, hey, I gave him this building for this price because I wanted it. But no, like you just, you just work them up to that point by getting them to say no from the start. And then eventually they say, say yes and they're confident about that yes. So when you go into a contract, they're not, there's no retrading happening or them backing out or anything because it happens all the time. So that's, I think that's a golden nugget there. You know? I love that you just brought that book up because it's my favorite read. And, and for everyone here, the book, you've heard me mention it multiple times on the show, Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss. He's a, he's a former FBI lead hostage negotiator. Uh, through many of the crises in our in our recent history. And yes, Getting the Yes was a predecessor of that book written by somebody else. His is, is a bit newer. That book is all about emotional intelligence, right? And tactical empathy and like getting to know the person and their needs and, and their emotional desires before you worry about anything logical or, or you know, like fact-based, you know? I love that you said that. Well, Tyler, we could talk all day on any one of these topics. I'm probably going to have to have you back on on a couple of them if you're open to it. But before we get off, there is a couple of questions that I ask every guest on the show. Are you ready? Ready. All right. What is your superpower as it relates to your business? Uh, like I said, you know, closing deals, execution, and, and getting them in the first place, getting the, the ones with the meat on the bone that nobody's getting. That's right. We heard a lot of good meat on that. And what is your biggest failure to date? And what did it teach you? Uh, you know, that's a tough one. But I feel like, you know, number one, not executing on, on, on certain deals. And because like me, and it's also like, I don't really think of it as a failure. I mean, it might have saved me a couple times. But like, you know, like for me, I'm known as the closer, right? So like, there, there was a deal with not enough meat on the bone. So I like I didn't go through and now to this day I look back I see someone did it and it's so like they made money and I'm like ah oh, man you know I could have owned that so like I, I like that bothers me a little bit but at the same time it's like it doesn't because I'm like you know I still made up for it because I went and focused on something else and made more money on something else so it's like that it is what it is but at the same time um, a failure I'd say an actual failure would be buying in the wrong location so that's yeah. that's a big that's a big one so like I've done that twice um, and it's also because like when you when you're in a rhythm and you have momentum you're, you're doing stuff eventually you're know, buying a dog I have a lot of like you know a whole group of things so it's like it just happened and I'm like oh I can make this work because you get a little confident you know you're like oh I can do it you know and I and I made money like it was good but I, if I was to take it back, I would never do it. Um, it was not worth it, not worth the stress level. I think that it affects your health. So like, I'm good with that. And, um, you know, I, I've dealt with some crazy situations on one building I bought in a terrible, lo it was a good location perceived for that area, but it just was a terrible building in, in that location. And there's like, you know, drugs and prostitution and crazy stuff going on. And I just, yeah, I think it, Put a dent on my health a little bit <laughs> man we've all had those yeah. i can I, mine is is ringing in my head right now so yeah if you if you're an, a, a habitual real estate investor eventually you're going to have one of those right and and we do everything we can to avoid but it is what it is sometimes you know well yeah. one of the biggest parts of the quattro four pillars is philanthropy and giving back and, and really just you know putting knowledge back in the universe what are your thoughts on that how, how do you give back and and, and support uh, you know, others in their growth. Yeah. So like, you know, my philosophy is, is, you know, I hustle, I work hard to build up an empire. Um, and that's what I'm constantly doing. And I want to build up for like the first, so let's just say I live to a hundred years old. Okay. And then, you know, I was just inspired by somebody recently and it's kind of, I was already thinking that way, but he just confirmed it because he's doing it. So I'm like, I love it. And the, the philosophy is when you're, when you're working, up until you're 50 years old and you build this empire and it's like you see all these guys Jeff Bezos you know Elon Musk it's like how how much are they really like intentionally giving back like it's just naturally happening through what they created but it's like no they didn't like create something to go like full-time giving back so a gentleman I just met um you know he built up you know he, he's, he's a multi multi-millionaire um 
and he built up this massive portfolio of apartments and stuff like that. It was very low key. But for the first 50 years of his life, the second half, he all he he's given $350 million back in charity. Basically, he creates foundations over in Europe, um, you know, different countries that are, are poor, and he just gives back. He's very that's his business now. He just it's all he does. He just it's like an active business for him. And you can see, and it, it, another thing that really inspired me, that really clicked with me actually, it totally challenges your mentality. So when you're first starting off too, during the first 50 years of your life, you know, you, you have kids, children, stuff like that. So you have, in his mind, you have a lot of risk. Because if you lose that income, lose that job, you have mouths to feed and stuff like that. So when you're 50 years old and over, you know, you, your kids are moved out. You really have less bills. So he's like, you have the ability to take on more risk, actually. So a lot of people get conservative when they're older for retirement, right? And they don't spend as much and they actually, you know, they reduce what they're doing. This guy, he's like, no, spend more, invest more, give back more. You have that ability. You actually have the ability to take on more risk because you don't really need much in life at that point. So for me, it really hit home for me, and I was like, you know, I would like to model that um, and have a, the ability to give back on a very large scale instead of doing it here and there and never really making an impact. I want to make an impact. That's incredible. I love the thought of you should be more aggressive when you're older. That's when you can give more than you ever have before because your ob- your obligations and, and those that you you know, have, have sworn to support and provide for are probably on their own at this point, right? I love that. I love that. And speaking of giving back, you have actually a way for people to learn from you via a mentorship program. How can people find that? Yeah, so I created that because I had a number of people that were looking for that mentorship um, during COVID when it all went down. And I was like, well, I can't individually spend all that time with one person. So I'm like, how am I to create a system so I can actually help these people do what I'm doing? Um, and, I, and I ended up spending like six months on that and developing it. And so now I do that. It's, it's teammentorship.com is one of them. And, um, you know, you know, you can schedule a free call with me. I'll do a strategy session with somebody. Um, but in a day, like what I'm offering is, is complete guidance, you know, um, as I help somebody along the way to, to really show them what to do, how to get the deals like I get that nobody knows how to do. Cause I don't share that stuff really. Like, like on a deep, deep level, I don't really like when I have, you know, people in my market call me up, like, like I like sharing, but I'm not going to share the details because it takes away from the people who are actually like paying for this to have that opportunity. So I want people that are actually willing to do it, who are motivated because they deserve it. So I'm going to, if they pay for it, they commit to it. I'm going to give them my full attention. As simple as that. That's fantastic, man. I love it. I love it. So is that the best way for everyone to get in touch with you? Should they want to reach out? Uh, yeah. You know, you can look up teammentorship.com. Uh, I think it's slash schedule. You can schedule a call. Um, I don't know if you can provide a link on here when you post it. Um, but yeah, you know, just you go through it. It's like two or three pages. You just, you know, submit an application. Yeah. And then I'll just, you know, set, a, set up a time with me. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll make it work. I'll get on a call with you. What an opportunity to be able to learn from someone like you, Tyler. I love it. So we unfortunately are coming to the end of our episode. I wish we could just keep going because there's so much here to talk about. But Tyler, thank you for coming on the show. I really appreciate all the wisdom and insight that you provided to our listeners. And I I can't imagine, you know, those of you who are looking for a way to get started in flipping houses or or buying multifamily, reach out to Tyler. Like, I know him personally. The guy knows his stuff. Everything he just said is legit. You know, this is someone you can really learn from. Take this as an opportunity. All right. Tyler, thank you for being on the show. Everyone, this has been another episode of The Real Estate Runway, over and out. Thanks, Chad. Appreciate you. We hope this episode was insightful and brought value to your day. If so, please be awesome and leave us a five-star review. Find out how Team Quattro can help you at thequattroway.com. Until next time, this is The Real Estate Runway Podcast.